God we can believe in. It's going to be an individual journey. It's going to resonate within our own hearts. And I want to just take now some of the questions that have been coming in beforehand and during, and, and, and maybe touch on some of the things we've talked about, and see if we can't reiterate some of these ideas. I think one of the ones that um, was frequently talked about from Austin, Texas, to Kennesaw, Georgia, to Portland, Oregon, to Merle, South Carolina, was how to keep faith when the answers don't come. Now this is a really tender question. And for me, that's where I think the Bible is such an amazing resource. Because this isn't new. Many, many people have struggled with this. And it's the examples we find from, from Paul, who was in prison for two years, really for no crime other than he had a different view of God, God's love and grace. And yet, some of those letters he wrote from prison were some of the most inspiring, joyful sense that love had not stopped, grace had not ceased, that he had more opportunity to share that message, and in fact, getting out, he went on more journeys. We have the example of Joseph in the Old Testament. Everything seemed to go from bad to worse in his case. But each step of the way, it talks about how he had this ongoing relationship with God. That this ultimately so transformed the situation that he was finally in a place where his gifts could not only lift his own life up, but could be a blessing to his own community, his family, and the wider, wider community. But there are many prophets, Jeremiah, who was in a pit for however long, um, people who continue to look at the tough things, the exile, where for many years the children of Israel were living far away from their homeland. God had not stopped being God. The human experiences we go through are just, to me, opportunities where we're asked to grow in grace, where we really have that prayer continuing to turn to God and deepen our experience, what God is. Remember, Mary Baker Eddy, her own experience was a tough one. It simply said, what we have humanly isn't enough. It's too vulnerable. It's causing us to go back to God who is unchanging, a God who is never absent. We deepen this. And part of it is that wonderful sense that Jesus is the ultimate model for all of us. No matter what we face, it can be overcome. We don't end with a crucifixion, we end with a resurrection. And ultimately, an ascension beyond all the limits of the human condition. Hebrews 12 is a wonderful uh, reminder that when things are tough, we just feel like we're flagging in our race. We look at Jesus and his life and his ministry and his teachings. We begin to find what he knew about God that speaks to each of us today, about God's constant love. One of the beautiful things that, that is offered is right in the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, you know, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Then he follows it up with everyone that asks, seeks, knocks, everyone shall be answered. That's my hope and my model. And when I've had things that have required persistence, I know that I've, I've got a model that we can overcome through what God is and what God does. We have a question from Thomasville, Georgia. Can you respond to the fears that there's not enough to go around? Now, this came up in many different questions. Not enough jobs, not enough um, uh, resources to provide for health care for everyone, especially as it looks like health care is going to become more and more expensive. Well, I love again going back to what God is. Can we ever have a shortage of truth? Is 2 plus 2 equaling 4? Is that ever going to not be there for us? Well, again, these ideas are interchangeable. If we can't have a depletion of truth, we can't have a depletion of life and its vitality and its activity.
activity, that's opportunity, that's creativity. We can have a depletion of love that is nurturing and strengthening and sheltering and guiding. All these things that what God is, we can't have a shortage of intelligence, fresh way of looking at things, a new receptivity. We can't have a shortage of the wholeness and beauty and goodness and abundance that is the essence of soul. We certainly can't have a shortage of the inspiration, the vitality that is spirit, all of them. This principle is never wavering, and each of us is included in it. Impartial, universal, inclusive. From Decatur, Georgia, how do you stay focused on God when everything is going wrong and the odds are stacked against you? We've talked a little bit about prayer, but it's a good question about how do we stay focused? Well, you know, again, I go back to the Bible. It's a great place of, of, of inspiration, and that takes discipline, and I love the fact that it's the same root word for disciple. It takes practice. It takes a commitment. It takes a willingness to keep at it. Anything worthwhile, whether we're trying to run a marathon or we're um, trying to uh, finish knitting a sweater or we're trying to do anything, it takes a commitment. It takes a discipline, a wonderful sense of working with God. And, and that's one of the things. Remember, willingness is an important part of prayer that is effective. Prayer where we actually let our heart and our mind change to become more aware of what God is and does. Practice, practice, practice is the only way I know to continue to discipline our thinking, continue to discipline our hope, um, continue to turn away from the shadows of doubt and fear and worry and turn back towards the light. Practice. And if we get it wrong sometimes, that's all right. If we're practicing the piano, we might hit it wrong several times. We learn that we can keep at it until we do it right, until we overcome the very thing that has been in front of us. And again, I find that each experience is an experience that helps us grow in grace, in, an exception, in, an, in accepting the love and goodness and grace of God in that transformative experience. Can you address the end of the world fears that it is happening soon. This has certainly been something that's been talked about quite a bit over the last few years with the uh, new millennium and it just hasn't stopped. In fact, we hear a lot about oh, it's going to end in 2012 because of the Mayan calendar. Well, I kind of have two answers to that. One is sort of some of the new um, uh, research going on. Uh, uh, in the Mayan calendar, just a recent headline, uh, that they found a, a much older calendar that goes way, way back farther than what they thought and way, way, way further into the future than they thought. That all they were looking at was like looking at a calendar of, of January and February when there was so much more beyond it. So simple research is helping to collapse some of the, um, uh, the sense of, of these calculations towards the end of the world, but so many of them come out of the book of Revelation. And again, um, some research has been coming out. One of the premier uh, um, theologians, uh, Elaine Page, has just written a new book on Revelation, putting it in the context of its period and giving some uh, thought to how it would have been read by the contemporaries. Well, that brings me to a second point, which is apocalypse is really the Greek word for revelation. That's all it is. It's not about the end of the world. It's about revelation. And as you read that, you know, difficult, enigmatic book, you find that it really is revelation upon revelation about the power and majesty and goodness of God. God's goodness triumphs again and again, no matter what comes at us. And the uh, opposite sense of goodness is portrayed in, in mythic terms as a dragon with many heads because it looks like this to one person, it looks like that to someone else, and this to another person. And that's overthrown by God's angels or messages. So I look through the, the book of Revelation and I just see it as a wonderful exclamation point to the allness of God. And that while we may be humanly wrestling with it the way we may wrestle with a flat earth perspective, the real perspective is there is no more suffering when we recognize 
the allness of God. Again, it can't be just an intellectual reasoning through things. It's got to be something that touches the heart. It's got to be letting that Christ really illumine for us a true sense of things. From Ridgeland, Mississippi, the question, do people have unknown barriers to getting their prayers answered? Well, I hope we've covered some of these things today that, that when we feel our prayers aren't answered, we're probably still feeling we're in the shadows. That there's, um, again, maybe it's our own fears, but maybe it's the fears of the community around us that have kept us from feeling we could turn to a wider sense. That there are resources for everything we're facing. One of the things I love is that because God is infinite, God is bigger than any problem we face. No matter how difficult it is, truth is bigger, life is bigger, love is bigger. And just beginning with what God is, is going to help me begin to have hope and maybe confidence or faith until I finally get an understanding God, in fact, is providing everything not only I need, but all of us need for all of us. From Daphne, Alabama, the question is really about how can prayer solve anything physical, change a blood count in a lab test? What's the success rate with such kinds of prayer? And isn't medicine easier? Well, you know, it's a good question because certainly everything that gets advertised to us is that there's another quick remedy out there that can alleviate the suffering we're feeling for this or that or that. That's the model before us all the time. But for people who, like me, were experiencing a physical malady, an inherited condition that there was no answer for, it was a, a time where the only place we could turn was to something larger than what the human paradigm offered. So is it easier to take a pill? Maybe so for some people, but it doesn't get to the deeper answers. Remember, Mary Baker Eddy explored a lot of these same concepts, allopathic, homeopathic, mind cure. It didn't result in permanent healing. How do things change? We begin to realize, again, that we're not on a flat earth that seems limited in what we see and experience with our five senses. There's a whole different way of looking at life it reveals far more than is evident to the five senses. And as we begin to see more of the substance of life already there, is it any surprise that we begin to notice changes going on? The wider our view of the earth, the less and less flat it appears. Nothing has really changed but our perspective. We see more and more of what really exists. And for me, physical healing, like the healing of the flu that I have, the healing of bipolar, what I've seen other people who've come to me with physical problems, is that the physical problem was really that sense of shadow cast over a sense of health. And this is what has shifted away from that sense of shadows concealing our true health and feeling what is really there, the substance of our life, is illuminated by Christ. Uh, right along the lines, uh, there's much talk and thought given to obesity, diet, exercise. How would you address this issue? Um, a lot of it has to do with what is our, uh, our motive. And remember, we talked about that first commandment. You, know, you shall have no other causes but me, spirit. Well, are we going to say that our life is, have, has the cause in it of diet? Has the cause in it of food too much, food too little, uh, not enough exercise? Are we going to be bowing down to those kinds of causes? Or are we going to get a higher perspective and say, no, my life is originating in God, an unchanging principle. That's going to give me the wisdom to have a normal sense of life. A normal sense of, as Jesus said, take no thought for what you shall eat or what you shall wear. And it wasn't, don't do it. It's don't let that become the God that you bow down to. We do things normally and naturally until we outgrow them. At some point, we may outgrow those whole sense of exercise and diet and so forth. But in the meantime, normalcy and a sense of expressing qualities 
you know, exercise. I loved playing rugby when I was playing rugby. It was a wonderful sense of vitality and creativity and strength. And these are all spiritual qualities that I saw very much originating in God. And I had an opportunity to express. So my playing rugby was actually in praise of God and God's qualities. I was expressing those in my life. This is from Newmarket, Tennessee. What particular understanding of God would help parents and adult children address the child's loss of health, job, housing? One of the most important things to me is to remember that just as the sun is connected to each individual ray of light, each of us is connected to God directly. God's love, truth, life, spirit, soul, mind principle is expressing itself to all of us, embracing all of us. And what we can do is, is recognize that what God is, the intelligence, the creativity, all the things are coming directly to that child to help them see what is really there, the opportunities that are there. I'm, I'm looking at our time a little bit. I know we could go on and on and on. But I'd like to just conclude with the idea that as each of us probes these questions within our own hearts, thinks more deeply about the nature of God, we're going to find that our individual journeys have us wrestling with these questions and that touch of the Christ, that light of the Christ is going to illumine for us the answers that we need in our life. It's going to be something that touches both our head and our heart and can bring restoration, resolution, healing, whatever we need for ourselves, our loved ones, or our community. Sometimes it does take persistence, but that persistence is something that simply allows us to experience more fully all that God is and all that God does. And not one of us is left out of the grace and goodness that belong to a God we can all believe in. Thanks for joining me tonight. Look forward to you carrying on these discussions within yourself and with others.